purposeful play, purposeful work, rugged outdoor living, our camps and conservation efforts, teach timeless skills, and kindle the spirit within. Farm and wilderness, farm and wilderness, farm and wilderness. Welcome back, everyone, to the Farm and Wilderness Podcast. It is so great to be back with you. My name is W. I'm one of the camp directors here at Farm and Wilderness and the host of this series. Now, I hope you've been listening and heard all the great interviews we've had so far with some of our camp directors. And I'll admit this podcast has a bit of a wide and nebulous audience, right? It's for current and future families. It's for current and past staff. It's for alumni campers. It's for other education professionals and other people in the summer camp world. And other episodes are a bit more broad, right? These last interviews have really been aimed at families, prospective families, and former staff. But this extra special episode is really for our families who are coming this summer because we are going to go over all the things you need to pack to make this summer amazing. Now, if that's not you, you're welcome to listen in because I have a great guest for today. Or if you're another summer camp professional that is just curious how we do this, well, I hope you enjoy this episode. Now, we at Farm and Wilderness really wanted to make another resource for families who are wondering, what do I pack for my kid for their overnight? How do I make sure that they are successful? And while I do know a lot about this, there's actually one person in particular that I had to talk to for this. You know Sam Green best from all the Instagram posts with goats. Or if you're a prospective or former family, Sam Green sent you a lot of emails getting ready for the summer. And so I am so excited to welcome Sam Green to the podcast. So Sam Green, you feel a little bit like an institution to so many of our families and staff and campers. But for those who don't know you, tell us a little bit about yourself. Who are you? What is your background with farm and wilderness? Sure. So uh, I'm Sam Green. You can use she, her, hers, but they, them, theirs would be more accurate. Uh, you might recognize me from emails uh, reminding you to fill out your camper's profile information. If there's a picture with a goat in it, I might also be there as well. Uh, I've been with Farm and Wilderness for, I think I'm reaching 10 years, if not there already. I started out at the day camp, uh, hanging out with the butterflies there. That's what we call the four-year-old group. Just loved it so much that look at me now, it's my year round job. So I went from that to being assistant director. Uh, I did work projects for a while, love doing some, it's uh, one of the best parts about where my office is now is that I can still hear the hammering happening at work projects down at the barn Mm -hmm. day camp. Uh, And so year round, I really just like to help people get, we get information about all the kids that are about to attend camp, collect all that information and make sure that it's ready for all the folks that are going to actually do camp and deliver that program to them and have it ready for them. Uh, So a lot of information. That's what I like to do. I like to collect information and give people the information they need. That's, that's what it boils down to. And so specifically, I'm really excited about this because one of the things I, I missed the most that was hardest for me when I left working at the barn day camp um, was before every overnight, I would do a skit about uh, having packed my bag and being concerned that I was a little rushed the night before. And maybe I had put uh, a couple of silly things in there. Uh, You know, Mm. some notable oopsies were uh, Mm. I once packed a brick and then for the second session, a different brick. And then for the third session, a very different brick than the last time. And they really were all different bricks. Or like maybe I bring my boom box along accidentally. My favorite moment was though when I packed a hammer, right? Because I love work projects. Um, When I pulled that out, the campers were like, no, you don't need that. And I was like, well, how am I going to ring the bell to know what time it is? Because we use this bell system to let you know when it's time to switch activities. And in unison, so many of them so excitedly yelled out, you'll listen to your counselors. And I went, that's right. You'll listen to your counselors. And there was a beautiful, you felt that wash over the uh, the circle. And it was maybe I peaked then at the uh, pack out skit. Um, And so the nice thing... (laughs) is a lot of the stuff that we're going to talk about, um, like quality of items, the general, how they're going to come to camp and maybe how they'll come home from camp is going to be the same across any of our programs because it's all going to happen in the Vermont wilderness. And there's just little tips and tricks, maybe if you haven't experienced it yourself, that we'd love to give you insight that's easier to say out loud as we're chatting rather than uh, me trying to cram the PDF packing list with too many 
little nuggets of information. So it's a perfect little, if you want to download that from our website and our family resource guide, have that right in front of you. You can follow along. It's kind of like having us, you know, a supplemental director's cut audiobook version of the packing list. Sam, you jumped in and took so many of my notes already. That is great. So let's go to the packing list. And what's kind of exciting for families is that we are putting a voice to all those emails and this PDF that you are going to be giving. So when you families are going through them, I want you to really hear Sam Green voice kind of in the on your shoulder there saying, hey, hey, this is the things that you need to pack. I hope you can hear me. You can just hear just like I get excited when I actually meet a lot of the campers in the summer because you go from being a name, you know, on a screen, on a file to a real person. So, yes, I have a voice. Hi, here it is. Enjoy it. I'll read you an audio book if you like. Maybe. I don't know. I've always dreamed of doing that as like a secondary thing. I think you'd be great at it. That'd be fun. So like Sam said, if you have the PDF or you can go get it real quick, that would be super helpful as we go through it. But you don't need it. You can just kind of listen to Sam and I talk about all the things. We'll bounce around the PDF a little bit. We'll talk about storage. We'll talk about what campers need to bring to where. We'll talk about the tools they need to bring. And along the way, we'll be giving you a bunch of pro tips and do's and don'ts that Sam and I have just learned over the years of doing this. And we have so many pro tips to share with you. So Sam, let's start with the thing that maybe often gets overlooked, but is actually pretty foundational and is maybe the most important thing. And let's talk about storage. What do you put your things in? What should families be bringing for overnights? What do they need to be thinking when they think about buying or getting storage for our campers? Uh, I think it's really helpful if they have one large item that's going to hold it. So like uh, when you picture summer camp, right? Like if you get a little too bucolic and in your brain about idyllic, whatever, you might think of a footlocker, you know, like the little chest that comes out. Great. Totally fine. Uh, That's an option. If you've got one aces. And that's not the only option by, by and large, you know, um, you might have, uh, those like a plastic tote. Those work great. They're super rugged. They're waterproof. The tops click on. I like the clicky on handle kinds, but I know for some folks that that can fall off. So it's kind of a challenge by choice. You know, I think a theme, if I can even hit it right out of the park here is really hoping that you can find some repurposed stuff that you have already. Um, you know, that's a big thing for us is you know, as you know, your kiddos are all growing and changing. And I really hope a lot of this stuff should be stuff that either is um, easy to find, maybe find secondhand or thrifted or uh, that you've already got maybe in a garage or in storage or, you know, a neighbor or something. So um, even for that storage bin, right, like those flip top kind of ones that you can get. And so at the packing list, we try to give an example of like four different types that just kind of link out, I think, uh, to different sites to give you an idea of what you're using. You know, height wise, if it's shorter than 18 inches, that's really key because it'll fit underneath the bunks, if you're going to be at uh, one of our Woodward area camps or Saltash Mountain um, at Flying Cloud and at Red Spruce Grove, they don't be, you know, they have a different sleeping arrangement, so they're not going to have the bunks under. And still one place to store it all, I think, is is really key if you can do that. Like, of course, you can have a back like a little day pack or something. But when you're coming in uh, to just know that that camper's stuff is in one zone <laughs> is going to be really helpful for the other like group of people that they're living in community with in their cabin or in their tent. Um, you know, I say a tote or a footlocker, I kind of err on that a wheelie, a big enough wheelie suitcase that can also work. Um, you know, it doesn't get rain, rain, rain in our cabins, but if you can add a level of it being a little waterproof, I think that that's a fine way to go with it. So really just, you know, again, if you click through, uh, if you just are on our website and get that PDF of the packing list, you can see examples, something big enough to fit all of the stuff that we're going to say. So this is a decently size. This isn't like a, oh, it fits in the FAA approved overhead bins. It's not going to be that size of suitcase by any means. Uh, It's certainly going to be something probably once it's full, two people are going to want to carry. Uh, And we certainly, when you come to check into camp, we have all the staff is there, plenty of people around to help uh, as needed get this stuff up and down uh, to wherever the kiddos are going to be spending their time. So don't be, I guess, overwhelmed if it looks a little big, but if you're driving your kid to camp, make sure it fits in your car. All that's so great. And I would also like to add an important piece that I have found over the years is that if you were choosing between a duffel bag or like a sturdy container, I very much recommend getting something that has the kind of sturdy walls. You can get away with a duffel bag, But I think especially for our youngest campers or actually really any of our age campers, there's something about having kind of the the structure of a hard sided container that just kind of helps them stay just a little bit organized. 
a little bit more organized. All right, Sam, let's talk about clothing. Vermont has all sorts of weather. The day can start really cold and then get warm. So let's jump into it. What clothing should families be packing for their campers? So, um, I mean, the biggest question I think we get really is even like quantity of clothes. Uh, and that's, that's, you know, we always give a range. It's a little tricky, right? Cause we don't know exactly how your kiddo lives. Like, uh, with the amount that they, you know, I'll wear a pair of jeans, like five, six, seven times before I wash them. That maybe isn't for everyone. Right. So, uh, I'd say to have it in your brain that the laundry is going to go out like every week. So have like 10 days of available clothes, right? So they've got clothes to cover that overage. Um, and with that, yeah, we really do run the gamut of weather. Um, I would be shocked if we saw snow, right? That's probably not going to happen, but it's going to be chilly in the morning. So things like, uh, you know, like a cozy wool, like a, a pull on hat, that's going to be a great idea. Like a warm a knit hat, like a wool or fleece, you know, some cozy pairs of socks. I like to have a pair of long johns, you know, like one that's good for like sleeping in. You've got that sort of idea and layers, right? So we're going to talk about how, yeah, you can, you should have a couple pairs of shorts, a couple pairs of jeans, a couple pairs of short sleeves, long sleeves. I'm being vague on the number because you also know, hopefully how your kiddo dresses themselves and runs, right? If they're the type who's just living in basketball shorts, try and at least get a pair of jeans in there. Cause we do have some activities across most of our programs that are going to look for that. Um, and vice versa, as much as it doesn't get wicked hot here, it can get fairly warm. So even if they're not maybe the shorts kind of, of person or tank top, you know, it's not a bad idea to maybe have one just in case. Um, so that if they get a little too warm, they've got that. So you're really kind of thinking all across what their needs are going to be. Um, same. Uh, another thing that you're going to see throughout as we talk about clothing is a lot of times there's moments where we emphasize not cotton and that's for like a base layer. And so that can be either synthetic or wool. And that's just really going to help because if you've got those layers on and you do have some, like some sweat starting, you're going to not cotton's going to keep that cold on your body uh, versus wool or, um, you know, like sporty material is kind of the way that I would think of it. If I was going to the store, that's going to help wick it away and keep it away from their body. And just, that's a safety thing at the end of the day. That's just really um, wise to have, uh, you know, and wool socks. So um, spoiler alert, if you haven't already, um, our overnight campers as part of a welcome to camp, uh, you get a package from us. And that includes an example, a uh, pair of socks. Uh, one of my, if you'll indulge me in another anecdote, uh, when I was visiting flying cloud for the first time while it was in session, um, I was introduced at their circle and uh, upon hearing my name, we broke the circle. Um, a camper came up to me and he went, you're Sam Green, come here. And I was, yep, ready. What are we going to do? Uh, and he takes me over to his tent and pulls out like a handful of these big old thick wool socks that look brand spanking new. And he looks at me and he goes, why did you tell my mother I needed these? And I was like, <laughs> oh, OK, right, sure. And I realized, right, like welcome to a really good reason to even be doing this in a podcast form, right. Is to have this conversation on, on mass of when we talk about um, like wool hiking socks, we're not maybe meet we're, we don't mean like big, thick, heavy duty, mm, Vermont winter socks. Uh, you know, we send out these example pair, they're darn tough micro, like they just kind of look like a regular weight sock. The difference is just that they're wool. So again, if your feet get sweaty, it's not going to get cold. Um, they're going to actually, they're, they're like magic. They're the only socks I wear now. I'm very, into them, you know, you can wear them a couple days and they are going to be slower to be smelly than uh, other socks. I'm not going to say it's impossible for them to smell. Everybody's body is different, um, but that's a really good property. So if you go on like a multiple day hiking trip, you could wear, we have maybe one or two pairs of those socks and that would cover you for like two to four days potentially. So yeah, every camper will get a pair of those sent to them. And if you needed to supplement those, it's good. I felt good to give a real example of what we meant. So I don't have any more kids showing me their pile of unused socks that they packed. <laughs> Great. And speaking of feet and footwear, right, a couple things I want to lift up for families, particularly if you have a camper at a camp that has some sort of construction or uses of axes or knives, which actually is really all of our programs in some way, to be really thoughtful of the footwear that you're sending with your kid to camp. You will need to send with them a pair of closed-toed shoes in order to work with fires or knives or sharp objects or even the animals. And Something I want to make sure that I say multiple times, please, please, please listen. Crocs do not count at Farm and Wilderness as closed toed shoes. You need boots. You need something with a steel toe because Crocs, they look great. You can bring them. You can run around in them, but they're going to do nothing if 
a goat steps on your foot or there's an axe that maybe doesn't swing right or whatever is going on. So you need to really make sure you have some closed toed shoes. And for hiking, it really depends on what your camper is comfortable in. I do recommend if you do have the opportunity to get boots to break them in before camp and look for something that maybe has like a mid or a high ankle, give a little bit of ankle support for kids while they are hiking. If they come and they don't have the right shoe or that's not something you're able to get for them, not a problem. We have plenty of shoes that kids can borrow and we will make sure before we send them on a trip that they have good footwear to be successful. We want to make sure that we give them what they need, that that is not a barrier to enjoying camp. Now, Sam, I love the fact, and you probably like this too, that we are outside all the time and it's going to rain this summer, maybe, kind of. And so what are your thoughts on what kind of rain gear folks should be thinking about as they are starting to pack? Spoiler alert, it has been known to maybe rain in the summer. And I think one of the most more surprising things, uh, even for me, as I was a camp counselor and learning this, um, is not just like a nice, decent raincoat, like, or a, a poncho. That's uh, totally, I kind of think everyone's like, oh yeah, of course we'll pack that. Can optionally bring, you know, some rubber boots are a nice thing, but I can't preach enough how wonderful I think rain pants are. These are a thing that I've added even into my everyday life. Cause if I got to go do something outside, you know, camp doesn't stop cause it's rainy. We're certainly not going to do anything unsafe. We're not going to make you get too cold or whatnot, but if we got cool stuff to do, we got cool stuff to do. And so uh, a pair of rain pants, you know, there's there's a kind I personally really like, like they're frog togs that kind of remind me of the fabric feeling reusable shopping bags. They're kind of like a nice in between of those. You know, I don't you don't have to go full on crab ocean fisherman level. You can if you want. Those are just real big and real heavy. So I think that that's like I would never I, I don't even think I had looked at what those were before working at camp. And those have really made just my quality of life better. And they're like 10 bucks if you go to some like a store like that. So pretty good way to level up your experience, I think. Any less pro tips you might offer our families around clothing? Um, you know, the other thing I, I would really say, and this is across, again, across all of our programs, is this is not a time for brand new, fancy, nice stuff that you bought to get ready for school by any means. Uh, you know, we, like I said, we're not going to let the rain stop us getting on program. And a lot of the stuff that we do is out in the wilderness and with animals or in the woods. So it's likely uh, that the clothes, you know, even though we do laundry and whatnot, they might come back stained or dirty or with dirt or they could get uh, torn on a branch or something like that. So it's really just a you know, kind of just with anything, anything that's too precious that you'd be upset if it was ruined, this isn't the place to bring it just because we're, we're in the moment so much that we're not really noticing maybe that we spilled little tomato sauce on our shirt as we were all laughing around the fire or something like that. So definitely stuff that you feel is okay to come home with memories embedded in it. Totally. So I'm about to do this thing we do at camp. And if you have been a camper or been a counselor, you've probably seen this happen. I am going to ask a question to Sam in a leading way that's going to get to the answer that I need them to give me. So, Sam, should I put my name on my clothing? Yeah, I mean, I would say so every little stitch of clothing and belongings that are coming with you. That's the other thing. If it's already, if you were to stop and think, oh, I really don't want to write my name on this piece of clothing, then I don't think it should come to camp. Because if it's too special for you to write in it with a Sharpie, then it's too special for it to come to camp. And so that's kind of like the bare minimum. I know that there's like labels you can get put in. Um, and this isn't just, uh, you know, speaking as a Sam, don't just write Sam. Uh, because our, our <laughs> counselors and our staff are going to do their very best if they find a piece of an article of something that has been separated from a camper at their time. Gosh, I wish we could keep track of everything, but that seems like a really not possible thing at all. So you're going to have a better chance of success if that piece of clothing or that shoe even has their name or at least like usually your initials are a little more unique. So like S green might be a little bit helpful because it's like, oh, okay, we only have like four kids with the last name green at all of our camps. Only one of them is Sam Green. So just kind of put yourself in our shoes of, you know, we'll do our very best to try and match people up with items that we found in Lost and Found and uh, help us try and do the best at matching. And so at the end of the summer, you know, anything that's of a significant value, like think about 20 bucks or more, right? Like a pair, a nice pair of jeans, their sneakers, 
a sleeping bag, something like that. If we see that it's labeled, we know exactly whose it is. We can be in contact. We ship that out to you and we would just put the shipping charge on your camp doc account and get that back to you. But um, anything like an errant t-shirt, maybe a sock, uh, things like that. Anything that's kind of less in value or that you're like, no, don't ship home to me. We'll just donate that to local thrift stores and charities in the area. And from a director's standpoint, please do label your clothes for all the reasons that Sam just talked about. And just the amount of clothes we have to deal with at the end of the summer, random socks that I would love to get reunited with the other one if possible. So Sam, let's turn our attention a little bit to what kids need to bring to camp to do camp. Not so much what they need to wear, but what about tools, stuff for their cabin, for trips? What do those things look like? Uh, Wonderfully. And this is a thing that I, again, I really wish I, I hope everyone here like listening hears this is very little actually um, that you need to bring with you to enjoy all the things that we have to offer. You know, the things that we're going to ask you to have um, are, you know, two water bottles, right? Got to stay hydrated. Very important. We're busy. We got to love our bodies. Um, A flashlight or a headlamp. You know, I might say we definitely give the option. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. I'm a headlamp fan personally. Uh, If I'm going to be on an overnight, uh, even if I'm at the barn day camp for an overnight trip, I think those are really nice because if you're going to go have to use the Kaibo, the bathroom in the middle of the night, I like a headlamp personally. That's just kind of helpful. Um, It is easier to accidentally shine it in your friend's eyes. So I will grant you that that you have to with great headlamp comes great responsibility. And then slightly even optional, but if you want to like get that, you know, stuff to write home, we're really proud of the amount that we, you know, engage in the letter trade. So uh, another really useful thing can be practicing with your kiddo, how to address an envelope home. Um, you know, one of the things that I love and we we do our best to try and do is look at every piece of mail before it goes out into the post and ensure that it actually has a real address on it and that it will be mailable because we want to make sure that those are getting to you in the quickest time possible. And If they run out because they're writing so many letters, we will definitely make sure that they've got all that they need to write home or write to whomever, you know, maybe a list uh, that you pack with them that they have that has all the addresses they might need to know because maybe there's like a cousin they want to write to or somebody else. So that way they know if they want whoever they want to write to, they've got their addresses. That would be super helpful. And then, uh, I mean, another thing, if I could really, you know, let people know it's it's totally fine if you happen to have your own sleeping bag and um trip gear, like backpack and things like that. And really, truly, there is no need to go out and buy those things. I guess the the thing that I would really want uh, that I, I try and stress with folks often, um, because I understand wanting to have all of your own cool new things to have this experience, but you really don't need to buy your camper, their own frame backpack, their own sleeping bag, their own sleeping pad, anything like that. We have a really large inventory of gear that we make sure that we go through every year. We renew it. We buy new stuff frequently enough. Um, and it's a very common occurrence. Many of our campers um, borrow those items. There's there's not a difference with that if that's what you need to do, because we understand your campers are growing. They, oh gosh, it's one of my favorite things every year is to see how much bigger and different and all these kids are as they're growing. And so if this is an investment you've already made, because it's something that you do as a family, totally fine to have one. But please don't think that you need to go out and, and get one of those. Totally. And families, please don't hesitate to reach out to your individual director and check in with them about how they can support you, what inventory they might have, if that's something that you need. We have a lot of things at our camps and want to be able to share them as best we could. Although I have noticed that kids do like to pick out their own mess kits, right? The mess kits being the dishes that are used, the dishes and utensils used for eating on trips. We certainly have many to borrow, but there's something I think comforting for a kid that they chose that orange one or the one with the cool spoon, the one that they particularly like. So Sam, I do want to go back for a second and talk about headlamps and flashlights. And I very much recommend families to get a headlamp over a flashlight. It's just one less thing for kids to have to carry in their hands. And when you're looking for the headlamps, look for the ones that have the red light because those are best at night when you're reading because they don't have as much brightness and glare as one that doesn't. They're relatively solidly cheap, kind of wherever you you buy most things. A lot of folks do get those on Amazon. And kind of connected to that, Sam, are there certain things that shouldn't go to certain camps, right? I'm thinking about our Nineveh camps, Flying Cloud and Respoose Grove. Are there things campers shouldn't bring to those camps that they might bring to others? Um, So... Uh, flying cloud campers will not need a flashlight or headlamp at all. They will be uh, asked to bring if they can um, six to 12 emergency candles. And we have an example of that in the packing list. You can also reach out to us about that. Red Spruce Grovers, uh, when they go on their 
trips can use a headlamp for that. But for the rest of the time they're in camp, that'll just be held safely for them. So they won't have it then. Uh, so Tamarack Farm doesn't need any of this tripping gear because they're not going to go on wilderness trips. Saltash Mountain campers are definitely going to go on wilderness trips. So they need this gear. Timber Lakers, Firefly Song campers, they're also going to go on trips. And when you're at the barn day camp, when you're going on your overnight, uh, this is also just a good resource to have. You're going to need this stuff too. They've got a slightly separate packing list for barn day camp when they go on their trip. Great. Let's talk about bedding for a second. What should campers bring? Mm, my favorite. So our uh, camps that are around Woodward and Saltash Mountain Camp for the time that they're in camp, they have these uh, built in bunk beds. They've got a mattress on them and they're a twin size mattress. So if you're going to be at Timber Lake, Firefly Song or Tamarack Farm, you can bring two sets of twin fitted sheets, flat sheets and some blankets. I always say get a little cozy. I like that. You know, that's a good moment for like a fleece blanket. You can also add a sleeping bag kind of into that rotation. That's another good layer. If you've already got one, that's going to work aces. But again, if you'd need one for trips, we can always rent those out to your camper for their trips. And for those campers who are going to Red Spruce Grove or Flying Cloud, they should be packing a sleeping bag, a wool or microfleece blanket, and a ground tarp. Another question that I get often that I think I I really wish I had a better answer for. I always worry when I feel like what I only have is an infuriating answer um, is the degree rating of a sleeping bag for a kiddo. And again, I really only err on not giving an answer because I don't know how, what their needs are. I can tell you that it's not certainly going to be, usually it doesn't get below, like in the forties here at night, like that would be a very cold night in the summer if it Mm -hmm. got to the forties and layers, right? So it's kind of like a, I personally would rather put more layers on my body to sleep with and then have just the one sleeping bag. I know other people like to have two, three blankets, maybe, you know, they got their sleeping bag, a sleeping bag liner and a blanket, and they're just wearing shorts to sleep in. So I think that that's, again, you can maybe try it out a couple of different nights and see like what you like to sleep in. Cause if you're, you're going to switch to sleeping into a sleeping bag, right? Like this is a new transition. It might be wise to kind of, if they've got that and that's what you're doing, pop it on their bed and let them try sleeping a night in it before they come to camp. I think the fewer surprises, the better. And they'll get a feel for what that's going to be like and how they're going to want to live like that. Mm, I think that last part is so key because I've had several families over the years say their kids swore up and down that they were just going to have their sleeping bags all summer. And those families didn't send any bed sheets. And about two days in, the kids are over it. So yes, having that conversation and having them try it first makes so much sense. So we talked a lot about the things you absolutely have to bring. Let's talk about some of the optional items, which this is where some of the more kind of fun and juicy pro tips will come from. Sam, as you look at the optional list in the PDF, and hopefully folks go download it and look at this list, what are things, Sam, that pop out for you from this list that families should know? Um, You know, I think the biggest one truly you know, campers, one of the things that I think is just ubiquitous across all of our programs is once they're old enough to at the barn day camp and at any of the other programs, uh, can you learn to use a knife? That's pretty exciting. That's not a thing they get to do in their everyday life. It's kind of uh, just like building fires, things like that. Um, and so a lot of campers really do like the idea of having their own knife. Uh, I totally get that and support that. And we do just have some rules around those because we're managing the safety of a whole bunch of kiddos. Uh, and so again, to participate in any learning how to use a knife, any of that sort of thing. We have all that equipment. You don't need to bring your own. And if you were going to, you know, I would nudge somebody towards the one we use at our program, which is a Mora companion knife. Uh, It's a Swedish brand. It's a fixed blade. Uh, Really important that it's not a locking blade because those aren't perfect. And that's just one more moment of an oopsie doodle that we just hopefully don't want to have to manage, Uh, you know, and those Fixed blade knives come with a sheath uh, and they'll be stored and and all that and handled properly by the grownups. But again, definitely a thing to get right and not necessary at all to buy before you're going to come to camp. Yeah, that's a good point. Let's talk about knives for a second for families who maybe never bought a knife and don't know what it means to be a fixed blade or switch blade or anything like that. So what you don't want to send with your camper is a knife like a Swiss Army knife or anything that has a blade that folds down. And often families might think that's the safer option. You know, they're not going to poke themselves. The blade is away. And really, we have found over the years that kids have nicked themselves when that blade is closing, right? And so you need to have a fixed blade knife that is in a sheath. And that might look a little crazy, again, if you don't buy knives. But we absolutely found over the years that those are the safer and better options, 
And again, please feel free to email your director with your questions. Hey, is this the right knife? Because every summer I do have to confiscate knives the first night because families have brought or sent with their camper folding blades or Swiss Army knives or things like that. Please do not send those. Sam, what else is on this list? Um, You know, another thing that is so nuanced is if uh, a camera, right? And wanting to preserve, we totally get that. We While we have photographers that go throughout camp and try to capture some moments uh, so that the grownups at home can see what's going on and so that we can show folks what a summer is like with us. Uh, you're super, you know, we, I like to think we're single-handedly bringing back the disposable camera era. I remember them in high school. I'm so proud that I know how to use one. Um, so like if you go to a drugstore, there's disposable cameras, uh, you know, Polaroids have had a resurgence. That's a thing that is totally uh, permissible. Just an extra thing. If you've got that, if you have a digital camera where you can turn the screen off. So, right. We're really balancing living in the moment with wanting to, we totally get it's only a few weeks in the summer. You want to preserve those memories. Um, but there's a slight difference to having that immediate, oh, let me take 13 pictures to get the right one where we're kind of living still in the candids. So if you're going to be going with a camera, it's one that's just send it out to be developed or wait till you get home to upload it on the computer and you didn't see what it was and hope that you got the moment, knowing that we've also got photographers that are capturing overall moments as well. Another big thing uh, that I I never knew existed before I came to camp were these uh, mosquito nettings. So, right, we are outside. It's not Like, I think you're going to be a buffet for bugs if you come to camp. That's certainly not it. I just know I happen to be one of those people that mosquitoes find really wonderful and irresistible. Just, you know, can't help it. I'm magnetic. Uh, We've got plenty, A. So if your camper requests one, we can certainly get one and put it up for them, help them with that. And if you want to go get one while you're out preparing, uh, you should find them at like sporting goods stores, things like that. And they just go up with thumbtacks on the wood around their bunk goes underneath their bed. And it's, it's kind of like a fun canopy almost. I don't know. There's something that feels magical about the mesh all around it. It's like a nice bit of way of having walls, but not having walls. Yeah. And thinking about those mosquito nets, right? When you're shopping for mosquito nets, they come in all these different shapes. The one you really want is the one that fits in a bunk. And so is the shape of like a box or kind of an elongated box. And from a director's standpoint, I really tend to recommend these for our very youngest, the nine and 10 year olds for sure. If nothing else, it allows them to cocoon a little and feel like they have their own space. I've certainly seen over the years that as they get older, they feel less of a need for them. But if you have a kid who might be their first time in an overnight camp, go and get them a mosquito net. It's just a nice, helpful little thing. And getting that set up on the first day can be a really, really comforting experience for families and campers. Another thing I want to lift up is musical instruments. So music is a big part of a lot of our camps. And this is a big decision that families have to make because instruments are not cheap, right? And like what Sam was talking about around clothes and the ones to get dirty versus not, you need an instrument that, you know, we don't want anything to happen. And it's kids at summer camp, so something might happen. So if you are having your camper bring an instrument, make sure you're sending it with a sturdy, hard case, right? Especially for guitars, those tend to be work best at camp. And we've certainly had trombones and flutes and tubas and piccolos and all sorts of instruments. But again, really make sure that you feel like your camper can be trusted with that kind of big, expensive thing. And at all of our camps, there will be some sort of centralized indoor location. But again, inside is relative in the places that we are because they're not necessarily going into cabins, but they might be in a main lodge or at a stage. And again, our buildings are sort of open. They're not climate controlled. Please do reach out to your particular director about instruments and they can give you a bit more details on those. And then I think the the thing I, if I were to pick a thing that I know I would want to know more about on this whole list, and I would definitely be bringing with me is a stuffed animal. Uh, you know, I brought one with me on every overnight I did at the barn day camp, uh, and I still have an assortment. So it's, it's, uh, this, I think is another one that's really tricky, right. Of it can be one of your most special things that you have and really helps you sleep. And we just don't, you know, everybody's doing all the best that they can to not have something happen, but it could get dirty or even lost. So I like to kind of have like, I got a crew of some stuffies that I have. And, you know, I personally don't bring the one that I have had since I was a baby, but I've got a couple of nice cozy things that I would pick one and know that it's, uh, you know, packable, for example, and still uh, very huggable, does the job for me, smells like home, does all those things. Um, and can maybe come back and also bring some stories back to the rest of the stuffies that I have in my arsenal and tell them about all the adventures that they had at camp with me, mostly just sitting on my bed. 
Well, so we've been talking a lot about what campers can bring. Let's talk for a moment about what they can't bring. So we're actually going to run through this list. We haven't really been reading through the list, but we will at this point because we really want to make sure that we are crystal clear about what you can't bring and give a little bit of why behind some of these things that might feel maybe, you know, why is that on the list? So Sam, let's start with electronics. You've already said some stuff about that. No electronics. Is there anything else you want to add about that? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've definitely gotten questions about it. Uh, it's important to note that there's not any place to plug anything even in at any of their cabins, right? So uh, that's, you know, somebody once asked if they could bring a hairdryer. I mean, you could technically have it. It's not going to work. <laughs> there's nowhere for you to use it. So best just to leave them at home. No money. Don't bring money. There's nowhere to spend it. We don't have a camp store in any way, and we will provide your kiddos all the things that they need. So don't bring any money. But on these first two things, electronics and money, here's something to think about if you were sending your kid up on the bus. So the bus will have restrooms in it. It won't be stopping. They're not stopping for snacks for a smorgasbord or something. And they can have devices on the bus to entertain themselves as they're coming up. When they arrive at camp, they will turn it over to camp staff and camp staff will hold those things until the ride home and they'll give them back. And so please do talk to your kids if they're going on the bus so they're not shocked when we are taking their devices once they get to camp. And honestly, like Sam said, there's nowhere to, to plug them in. So Sam, can campers have food? You shouldn't pack food. You also shouldn't mail your kid food while they're at camp. And A, it's not just because we have really wonderful staff who works in our kitchens to make us beautiful meals. And we really do want to make sure every kid, it's never, we don't want your kiddo to feel like there's going to be scarcity of food, right? We're going to always provide them food. And keeping food in your three-sided cabin or in your tent is going to send out this beautiful odor to the animals like chipmunks or squirrels that are going to go, hmm, is that an apple? Oh my gosh. Let me, let me try and nibble on that and nibble through this backpack that you have to get to that granola bar that they've stored inside. Uh, and so even though we can't smell it, they can. And, um, you know, I don't even need to get into bigger animals to worry about because truly I don't think you need a chipmunk running across your face when you're in your cabin. So if you think that is what's going to happen, if you have food in your cabin, I think that's enough of a deterrent to not want to have any food in my cabin. Uh, if you have any dietary needs or preferences, things like that, Plenty of grownups at camp are the staff who are, want to help make sure that you are supported and fed well. And to add on to that, there's no guarantee that if they bring that food up on the bus, it's going to be ready and edible three weeks later for all the reasons that Sam just talked about. We will make sure they have snacks on the way home. And in fact, one time I had an apple core that I just got into camp. It was in like two or three Ziplocs in the middle of my bag and chipmunks ate through multiple layers of my bag to get to that apple core. So it's a real thing. Don't have food in your cabins because the chipmunks will eat through things to get to them. Um, also, no hatchets. You don't need one. You don't need one. <laughs> um, it's yeah, there that's all we got. <laughs> people think about, oh, I'm going camping in the woods. And you're like maybe looking for that bug net in the sporting goods store. And there's a really cool hatchet there. You know, we we definitely teach kids like kids have the option at some of our programs to learn how to use an axe, for example. Um but we don't happen to use hatchets personally, and uh, it just can be a confusing thing. So it's easier to flat out say, nope, you don't need one. Don't bring one. Another thing to not bring, no weapons or firearms of any kind. And this actually comes up most with things like swords, right? No toy swords, nothing like that. Rarely happens. But again, if you have questions, check in with your director. No tobacco, drugs, vape materials, no smoking, drug use, or vaping of any kind is permitted on property and is grounds for immediate expulsion from our camps. And as you think about, again, your camper and where they're going, making sure that they know what's being packed, right? Well, well, Sam talked about that. You need to know what's going in their bags. And I've seen this in my time here. So please, 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 please don't assume that it couldn't happen because it certainly does happen and has happened. Reminder on knives, no knives with blades longer than four inches, no folding blades, those will be taken. No, again, no multi-blades, no Swiss army knives or multi-tools like a Leatherman. They're great. Don't have them at camp. Just the sheath fixed blade that we talked about. Uh, what else can folks not bring? 
Uh, like we said, there's no need to bring any candles, lighters, or matches, save for the flying cloud campers who will bring candles specifically asked, but any fire making supplies, any fire making that we do, we have all of the things that you need for it. Uh, this would include not bringing, uh, those striking flints. There's no need to bring, you know, uh, it's just, again, another safety thing. Anything, anytime it's time to make a fire, our staff will have everything that the campers need to learn that skill and practice it safely. Also, as you're packing, uh, you know, when you're buying all these supplies, make sure that uh, no, there's no breakable or glass bottles going in. You know, if you end up with some really nice plant based body wash that came in a glass bottle, it might be time to repackage it into, you know, some of those TSA reusable bottles or something like that. Uh, just because we're in the woods, we don't want to break a bottle accidentally. Uh, same with aerosol sprays. You know, think more of the pump spray is fine. But, um, you know, an optional thing you might bring is some bug repellent, not the psst kind, but the ch -ch -ch kind. See, how am I supposed to write that on a packing list? You, you only can get that if you're listening to me. <laughs> so we've reached the part of the podcast that might actually be most useful for families, even if you've read the handout. Sam and I are going to do a lightning round until we can't think of any more of pro tips. Sam and I will go back and forth and we'll see who can get the last pro tip out there. Yeah. They're going to get real. I, I can't wait for the last asinine one of like, bring your items to camp with you. You know, I'm going to start off with a really, my biggest one is don't pack for your camper, but don't have your camper pack alone. This is definitely something that y'all should be doing together as a family. It's important for you to know and make sure that maybe none of the prohibited items end up on the, on the list, end up in that bag. And it's important for them to know what they have with them and where it's packed and where it is, you know, there's a certain amount of type two fun, which is fun after the fact and not when it's happening. If your kiddo returns home after three weeks and didn't only wore three pairs of socks because they didn't see where you packed the other ones. Right. And, uh, and conversely, we don't want anybody packing anything they shouldn't have with them. Maybe even it's a valuable item. It's a good time to have those discussions. Maybe you look together at their stuffies and say, Hmm, I know this one's the most important one to you. But let's think about who else maybe wants to go on the adventure this year. So this is a great time for you all to connect and get ready together. Good start. Um, my pro tip is back on the writing supplies. If you have a camper who maybe doesn't want to write an entire letter, send them with postcards. And the same idea, have them pre-stamped and all those things. It can be just a little bit less writing, um, particularly among the campers I see at Timberlake and can be super helpful. Oh, I like that one a lot. Oh gosh, that one like hit me so good. I have to think of another pro tip, right? Um, oh, you know, I think another really helpful thing is we're talking about this one container that holds everything at once. That doesn't mean it all needs to be in there loose. You know, things like packing cubes or smaller containers or bags in that bag. Really great way. Maybe you can organize that their clothes are in a thing, their socks are, you know, I know I like to keep all of my socks and underwear together. So again, kind of trying to figure out with your kiddo what organization is going to help them keep it all relatively organized as organized as they can while they're having fun in the woods. That's so real as much as much as they can and all the, the fun that they're doing. And on that note, medication, when you were thinking about packing medicine and it says this on the packing list, it will need to be turned over when campers arrive to camp. So a pro tip is to make sure that you pack that medicine in a place with easy access, like on the very top or like a side pocket and that your camper knows where that medicine is. Don't pack it first so it's under all the clothes. Pack it last. If you're driving your camper up, even consider having that already in like a Ziploc bag, not even in their bags, just ready to hand over to the nurse when you're checking in. And my pro tip is going to piggyback on that pro tip of all of those medications and supplements and over the counters need to be in their original packaging. Look, at home, I use a pill sorter to take my morning medication every day. And this isn't it. So make sure that it's in the original bottle. If it's a prescription that it's got the original bottle that came from the doctor, you know, with the doctor's instructions on it, all of that. Uh, otherwise we can't give it to your kiddo. And that's a bummer. So my pro tip goes back to the bunks that they're staying in. So if you are at a camp that has bunks, so talking about Tamarack Farm, Timberlake, Firefly Song, or Saltash Mountain, those bunks will often have little shelves in them. And so they're great places for kids to store some things, maybe some books, maybe even printed photos, right? Like old Polaroids. Again, nothing too crazy, nothing too valuable, but we really want campers to make the time that they're at camp feel like their bunk is theirs. 
Ooh, this pro tip is for my barn day camp families um, is to be prepared for when you're packing your kiddo out uh, on the first day, have like a large Ziploc baggie with a whole change of clothes for them. Like I would say mid weight, right? Like if they're usually a shorts kid, pair of shorts, maybe it's a pair of jeans, t-shirt, underwear and socks and have their name on all that stuff their name on the baggie and be prepared for it to be left in their cubby. I don't care what age they are. They could get into something or just have a little too much fun and have a moment where they need to change their clothes. I think, uh, bit huge just, and knowing that you're going to leave that there, I think is key, right? Like everything is not going to come home every day from the barn day camp. Most things will, you know, there's their swimsuit and their towel will also stay throughout the, throughout the week at the barn day camp. Uh, I'm starting to get to the bottom of the, the barrel. Mm, we've covered so much. We covered money. I can do another barn day camp one. Yeah. Do, do another barn day camp one. Uh, another tip that's a little more barn day camp specific. I see you, uh, is that remember that your campers lunch that you pack them is going to be eaten the way that it is at the time that lunch happens. So they're not going to have it heat it up. It's not going to go in a refrigerator. So ice pack it, thermos it, whatever you need to do to make sure that it's going to be delivered delightfully to them when it's time to consume those beautiful meals. I thought of another one, and this is a big one. It goes back to mailing. We talked about don't mail food, but really like what should you be sending? And pro tip here is send things to your camper or with your camper that they can make friends with others and share with their cabin. Right. So like books are always great. Graphic novels are great if, you know, they can maybe have someone else read them. But also think about like Uno cards, like we can never play enough Uno, other kinds of cards, other kind of games. Um, Oh, yeah. On the books, we do have libraries that are camps. And so they'll always be able to find something, but they should bring what they like. When thinking about the games, sorry, bouncing a bit. Uh, Make sure you have games that don't have a ton of pieces because those will all get lost. And since you did a double, I'd like to do another one. Be very, very, very thoughtful and check in with your director around trading card games. Think like Pokemon, Magic the Gathering, or anything like that. Depending on your camp, there might be different rules around that. At Timberlake, generally, we do allow those cards, but don't send the best card, the most magical card, the most powerful card. We cannot guarantee that those will get back because, again, we're outside in the woods. And, you know, we have issues sometimes with campers who really want those cards and we have to have conversations around those. So, again, with like instruments and all the things, don't send the best, most expensive card or things in those games. You don't know what I'm talking about. That's real. That's fair. Check in with your kiddo and see what they are bringing. Yeah, that's a big nuance of like, we certainly want to have the games and stuff that you can play. We used to kind Mm -hmm. of just say none of that. And I think it's nice that we're, you know, those things are seeing a resurgence. People are still connected through them. And it's a good, remember that if you're playing, you're maybe you're bringing those cards to teach somebody else how to learn. And you don't really need this ha 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 master deck to do that. It's like bring something that's, you're going to help somebody else learn. Think of it like that. That could maybe help you figure out what you're going to bring. Sorry. I couldn't not delve deeper into the, you, you had to, I mean, I I love those things. Um, Oh gosh, let me take a look and make sure. Mm-mm-mm-mm. Oh gosh. I don't know how I haven't talked about this topic. Um, fun dress ups, right? So like, yes, we are talking about, you're going to need clothes. Uh, you know, whether you're going to the day camp every day, or you're coming to an overnight camp, your basic clothes, you need to make sure that you have an outfit on that you can do the tasks of the day in. And there's nothing that says you can't be as interesting as possible while you do that. Knowing that If you've got like maybe your secondhand tutu that is really fun and is not going to get in the way of something, you can bring a couple of fun things with you along to dress up and be interesting when you're at camp. Uh, Some camps might have some loan out items that we can do, especially if an activity is going to involve getting dressed up and being extra fancy or extra silly about something. Um, But again, anything that comes to camp needs to be able to withstand camp or be okay with getting the effects of camp on it. Uh, And it's also just, you know, Big note, you can also check in always with your directors or with us in admissions that uh, any costumes that you bring are not going to be appropriative or scary or anything like that. It's really just, I, it's why I always like to say uh, as interesting as you can think of. Totally. And connected to the thing about swords I mentioned earlier, similar rules around Halloween, right? At certain schools, be thoughtful of it. If it's on the edge, check in with your director on whether that's a costume or like a prop for a costume that uh, can be good at camp. 
I don't know if I have any more pro tips. Sam, can you think of any more? I'm I'm like even just scrolling down. Um, I pack it all the thing. Gosh. Oh, got one. So um, one bit of feedback, because I always love to hear from families, you know, if something's confusing, please ask us questions. It's how we learn how to better give the information out. Uh, One thing I'm adding to the end of the packing list that you'll see when you are hearing this podcast, hopefully, if you've checked it out, is like a checklist. So I really tried when I made the packing list to have a lot of graphical examples so you could see what's going on. And I know it can be helpful to have a checklist and it can be super useful to have that checklist and maybe your own addendum like tape that to the inside of their trunk or their tote or somewhere and have that. So they know all the stuff that they came with and you can check that off and you're going, yep, yep. We got it. We packed everything that we thought you needed. And when they pack up and they're going through it again, maybe with, you know, they can go, Oh shoot, I did bring my stuffed cheeseburger pillow. Where is it? I have to find it. Cause it's on this list. And I forgot about it after the first week of camp. So that'll help one more tool to try and get all the stuff to come back home with you after a summer of fun. <laughs> Oof, that that's a good one to end on. And like from our counselors perspectives, it is so helpful. The number of families over the years who say after the fact, I packed my kid with three towels and we as staff only saw one, had no idea. So please do sort those things and just helps all of us take care of your kiddos. So Sam, as we start to wrap up, where can families find all of this information? They may already have the PDF, but where can they find all the essential information for families as they are preparing for camp. So when you go to the farm and wilderness website and they've got this little top bit where it says camps, admissions, families, hiring, et cetera. If you hover over the families section, there's a section that says get ready for camp and then family resource guide. Uh, And so the reason, here's another insider look as to what I do, why I do the things I do sometimes If you were to ask me for the packing list, I'm never going to send you the PDF directly. I'm going to send you a link to that part of the page because I think it's really helpful that you might stumble across and see our family handbook is there. Our health and safety guide is there. Uh, Our physical exam form is there. So it's just like a really great place where we're going to try and pack all the information there. It's also going to have the most up to date version. So if something were to change and it was major and we were suddenly like, everybody needs to pack a unicorn onesie and that's mandatory. We would let grownups know that we would send you out an email. Sorry, I don't get to make the decision. So that's probably not (laughs) going to be a change we make. Um, Any big changes, we're certainly going to let folks know. But if I notice a typo or something like that, I'll go in and and change it. And I put what what the last time we updated it there. Um, And if it's anything significant, what we updated. So you can kind of just keep track. That way I know folks are always accessing the most up-to-date version when I send them that link. This has been so great, Sam. Thank you so much for coming. And hopefully if folks are listening and giving us those five stars, reviews and ratings, we'll be able to come back in the fall because I think there are a couple of the things you and I could be talking about um, besides just packing for kiddos. So, Sam, we I appreciate you so much. Oh, right back at you. And I'm thinking 2024 is the summer that the unicorn onesie maybe will make them mandatory then, but uh, not for 23 quite yet. So. Uh, jokes aside, thank you so much for having me. And uh, it really is just nice to think about talking to everybody on mass at once. And there's a reason we're on the website with a little pop up that says, hey, can we answer any of your questions? Because uh, it's either going to be me or Jenny answering them at the first level. And we really do love to learn what we can learn from your questions and give people the answers that they're looking for. We can't wait to welcome you all to Farm Wilderness this summer. And that was my conversation with Sam Green, the institution that is the enrollment director. If you'd like to register, apply for a job at, or just learn more, check out farmandwilderness.org. We're also on YouTube, we're on Instagram, we're on TikTok, we're all over the place, and now this podcast. This has been an episode of our limited spring series for 2023. If you subscribe and leave us a good review, we might just be able to come back in the fall. Thanks to our guest, Sam Green, original music by Emmett Powers, recording and editing done by myself. Thanks to everyone at Farm and Wilderness who helps make our summers possible. Our camp vocabulary word of this episode is in honor of Sam Green, and it comes from the Barn Day Camp, who have this incredible day they do each summer called Topsy Turvy Tuesday. It's a wonderfully upside down day full of camp magic, silly activities, and a chance to wear that tutu you'll be bringing or the unicorn onesie that maybe you convinced Sam Green to borrow. And with that, 
Remember, camp magic is real, y'all. Until next time. <laughs>